What's up, everybody? Welcome to IGN Game Scoop. I'm your host, Damon Hatfield. Joining me this week is Justin Davis, Scoop. Tom Marks, Scoop, and Ryan McCaffrey. Ooh, I love that old school IGN.com <laughs> t-shirt. That's, that's the IGN I remember. Yeah, that's, that's hashtag my IGN. We've got a great show for you this week. We're going to talk about the prospect of a streaming-only console. Uh, we'll have a Nintendo Switch investigative report. But first, let's talk about this Fortnite game that everyone's talking about. Yeah. A game I have a lot of experience with myself. Uh, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I've never played Fortnite, but I, I am very in- I've, I've always been very interested in sort of a bird's eye view, just tracking big uh, trends within the video game industry. And uh, there's some new data from uh, analyst Super Data that clearly indicates Fortnite, despite big publishers like EA and Activision saying they don't feel threatened by Fortnite, they feel like it's a, what is it, the rising tide mm-hmm. lifts all boats? Is that the, yeah. is that the yeah. phrase? Despite them claiming that, I think there's some clear data that very, very uh, clearly does indicate Fortnite is drinking everyone's milkshake. Uh, Super Dad bring all the boys to the yard. <laughs> well, <laughs> these are <laughs> these are different references. <laughs> wow, those are that's a that's quite a mashup. <laughs> <laughs> a little no doubt for you on yeah. <laughs> well, not uh, music. No, that's not no doubt. That was uh, what, who did. Uh, what am I? Am I? I'm conflating my own. Yeah, it's uh, not no doubt. Here. Is it Fergie that did, did yeah. the milkshake? That that I think that was Fergie. All right, well, let's go with it. Uh, or not. It's fine. I was referencing There Will Be Blood. <laughs> <laughs> so that's where this whole thing started. It was the same thing, pretty much. All right, here's what we found. Superdata is looking at data from Q2 2018. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a considerable overlap between the audiences of Fortnite and other big multiplayer games that are popular on Twitch. Games like League of Legends, Counter-Strike, and Overwatch. There's a very similar audiences, uh, lots of overlap there. Uh, and Fortnite... In Q2, uh, the hours, the amount of hours that were spent watching that game on Twitch uh, were up by 59%. Every other game is down. Uh, League of Legends down 19%, Counter-Strike down over 50%, Overwatch down 16%. So the same audiences, but everyone is watching more Fortnite than all these other games. On top of that, looking at total digital console sales for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One in Q2 of 2018, total digital sales are up almost 50% year over year. However, if you remove Fortnite from the equation, uh, total digital sales are down 6% year over year. Mm. There is one caveat that, of course, if Fortnite were out of the equation, those dollars could have been spent elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But it's just kind of proving, super. it's just sort of proving the theory that, yes, since Fortnite is part of the equation, all those dollars are going to it instead of these other games. Uh, Fortnite's sort of like summary is where previously no executives admitted to a loss in player activity or spending, it is increasingly clear that the newcomer is Fortnite is taking market share from existing titles in addition to adding new players to the market. So bringing in new players and also stealing players from other games. Uh, do we think other like is it? What do we think? EA, Activision, the big guys. Mm-hmm. How worried about Fortnite should they be? I don't know about worried about. Yeah. I mean, like that that feels like the the wrong wording to me because worried about implies that it's a thing that's yet to pass almost. Like they gotta be thinking about it in the future a it's little bit. Too late. It's kind of already <laughs> happened, right? Like that's the, true. I feel like the damage Fortnite ha- is going to do has been done. And like it's I don't really think it's gonna get worse. I feel like this is just the new world they live in. And mm-hmm. They've got to adapt rather than like worry about what it's going to do to them. Well, it's interesting. Like Fortnite has grown beyond over the last six months or so from success into like mega success territory, sure. right? Yeah. Like into actual culture, like Minecraft level of like mm-hmm. cultural phenomena. One of the biggest games ever made. When but, Drake plays your game, yeah. you made it. Yeah. But whereas like Minecraft, I feel like did sort of open, you know, open up a space for games like Roblox and for you know younger kids that maybe weren't heavy gamers or you know grew up with like Lego and stuff like that. I do feel like Fortnite. Is is more of a direct shot across the bow of, you know, the Halos and Call of Duties of the world, in my opinion. Mm. Um, so it is, it, it, it's playing in that space that EA and Activision do need to be more worried about, whereas, like, for a long time, I think, yeah, yeah, Minecraft is this gigantic game, but it's kind of over here doing its own thing. Mm. And, and you can see that, I think, in similar cases with games that are not as much cultural phenomenons that, phenomenons that were just hits instead, like League of Legends, where League of Legends was... At a time, the most popular game in the world, it was absolutely enormous. But like you said, yeah. it doesn't. The the people who are playing Call of Duty are not necessarily getting drawn away to League of Legends. Where I think you're right that now 
this is sort of attracting that audience a little bit more. Like League of Legends is scary for a game like, you know, StarCraft or Dota, but maybe not right. as quite as much if you're making Grand Theft Auto. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that's part of it. This is off on a tangent, but yeah, you know, we haven't seen much more StarCraft lately, right? Mm -hmm. Like StarCraft is doing its thing and it's still doing well, but it's not talked about nearly as well, much. I feel like that's kind of the case for a lot of what you guys have brought up. That's the case for Dota. It's like, it's not... You don't hear about it every day, but there's this huge audience that's just out there mm -hmm. playing that game. Yeah. Same thing with Minecraft. Minecraft is no longer the, the uh, you know, cultural wall shattering buzzword anymore. Mm -hmm. But it's a huge thing that Microsoft continues to grow and put content out for, and and is played by millions every day. And I, you know, this is Fortnite's moment in the sun, and it's not going to go away. It's just going to. That sun will still burn in the sky. It'll, <laughs> but there'll be a, there'll be a cloud that eventually comes in front of it. Doesn't mean the sun's not still there. It just yeah. means you can't. You're, you're not like it's not obvious anymore. I feel like it's going to end up like Minecraft and like mm. Dota and League, where there's just it's a huge thing that continues to get played by millions of people. But it, you know, it, it's it's moment as the the peak of cultural zeitgeist will pass. Mm. We, it, it's it is unclear to me. Like you touched on this with the you say super data, I say super data. Um, or just data in general. Okay. Um, well, the super data data is the name of yeah, the yeah. analyst. I mean, the the data shows that, uh, it, yes, it's clearly taking audience away from these other games, but yes, it's also growing the pie as a whole. So mm -hmm. is the amount of new gamers or new attention on gaming or on shooters that you know this game has brought to the table, does that offset the audience that it's taken away from you know some of the existing competitive games out there? Like. It's really hard to say. Yeah. Um, I guess only if those new gamers do. Are they going to graduate? They are. They are younger, right? Yeah, so so. Uh, Fortnite, I believe, is rated T. Um, Could I, be ESRB rating aside, like that. You know, it's more cartoony yeah. and accessible and friendly. And so, as those gamers get to be, you know, 16, 17, 18, are they going to graduate to Call of Duty? You know, like mm -hmm. is this a good thing for yeah. for uh, for video games and for shooters? Unclear. Yeah, but it's definitely a possibility. Ooh. Ryan, what do you think it means for something like Halo, like Halo 6? Whenever that comes out, that'll be the first Halo to come out in a post-Fortnite. And a post-PUBG <laughs> world. I mean, yeah, a exactly. lot has changed since Halo 5 shipped in fall of 2015. It's uh, the last three years, so the yeah. landscape's changed a lot. And, you know, there was a, there was a comment from uh, Jeff Easterling at 343 this week that we covered on Unlocked. Uh, our weekly Xbox show, where he had somebody asked him on a on a there they do like a weekly mixer stream and said, "Are you guys thinking about doing a battle royale thing in Halo?" And he said, "Well, the only BR we're thinking about is battle rifle." I was like, "Well, first of all, <laughs> yes, yeah." I'm not sure if you had that response like in your back pocket ready to go, but that is an excellent response. And second of all, yeah, I mean, I think it's important. I mean, I think it would be extraordinarily foolish, uh, and we've seen some companies do this and and fall prey to it. Uh, it's it'd be very foolish to chase the uh, the trend. That's yeah. not a, that's not a good idea. Uh, you've got games like Rainbow Six Siege that continue to grow their player base. Mm -hmm. I think they recently announced, Tom. You, you keep a much closer eye on the Rainbow Six scene than I do. I think they hit like thirty million players. I think that's right. Uh, you know, registered players, and who yeah. knows how many of them are active at a given time. But it's a lot, no yeah. matter what. But there, you know, that game's getting bigger. Uh, you know, I, I think. Uh, you know, Call of Duties and Black Battlefield are, are trying to launch into the battle royale space. But if that fails, they've got their other classic modes to fall back on. I think it's important for Halo to to play to its own strengths mm -hmm. uh, in in the future. And and its strengths so far, it's it, you know, Halo is itself very quietly in the grand scheme of things. I think a very successful competitive esport. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the the arena mode of Halo Five is has continue to be built upon new maps and, and different tweaks and it's awesome and people there that community loves that game and and i hope uh, you know 343 won't lose sight of what halo is good at when it comes to evolving halo with halo 6 and mm. and I, I don't expect them to, to go out and and try and uh you know worry too much about what fortnite's doing mm. well this yeah. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to say, this is also that sort of, uh, it's the same situation, or I was literally just talking about this with Duggan earlier at lunch, is if every game in the world tries to become a living game, then there's just going to be <laughs> yeah. situations where some of them are we'll not die. talked about, will, will yeah. die, but also, like you said, are not talked about, but are popular. Yeah. And and I think that maybe that's the world we're going to live in post-Fortnite, is games that will come out and find mm -hmm. their audience and just... Do their own thing. So we, I mean, you, that's the part of the point that I was just going to make, where I think it's becoming increasingly clear, and will continue to become more clear as uh, we close out this year, that uh, Fortnite's big uh, 
the big sea change that it's going to bring to the video game industry is not actually it's battle royale mode. It's the weekly updates, right? Yeah. It's the new stuff every single week that you know Twitch streamers and YouTubers and gamers have to kind of chew on and go over, and you know a reason to like that's why like man, if you are a Counter Strike streamer or you know League of Legends or one of those games, like you are starving now, right? Like you are in yeah. the desert, like <laughs> and you're please, please, I need some water to drink. Whereas you know Fortnite's just like showering you with you know new content, you know new secrets, new guide stuff. I mean even IGN. Um, I almost said fallen prey, but that has, you know, such a negative <laughs> connotation. But even us, like, you know, our guide writers have something new to say about Fortnite every single week. Um, like if you are a game like Counter Strike or or I don't know why I mean, keep... Pub PUBG is probably mm-hmm. a good example. Like that sure. PUBG was just the it game. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now it's still huge, but yeah, they're not doing a weekly update, I don't think. Yep. No. So that's uh, right? what we'll see. And, and it's uh, they're updating. It's still it's just huge, not... but yeah, yeah, like Fortnite has is now the the it game where where PUBG was yeah. like six months ago. And this if, is a it, this is this is not a brand new. I think it was Halo. Goodness, Reach. I think was the first one I can remember having like daily challenges of like do these three things each day, and you would get some you know in game credits or whatever. So it's like this has been around since you know with, since daily quests in World of Warcraft. But to the degree that Fortnite has like uh, uh, polished that and perfected that sort of weekly content drop. Um, I, you know, the Battle Royale mode thing, like take it or leave it in Halo or Call of Duty or whatever, but we're absolutely going to see, you know, new stuff all the time, never ending. Like that's that's what's going to be the change. But one of the things that I think is really interesting that Fortnite has done with that constant update cycle is they're forcing you to interact with the updates and not the, the daily challenges stuff as yeah. much, but like when PUBG adds a new map, you don't have like you can mm-hmm. just keep playing your map but Fortnite has one map and Fortnite only updates that map and so when Fortnite pushes an update to the map it affects literally every player of that game and there's no way you can avoid it and it's, everyone is aware of it it's gameplay and it's story and it's uh you know character progression and it's all of it rolled together into one yeah eventually there's going to be a new map though they have to. No, no, I don't I, think I, so. I wholeheartedly, there has to be. I wholeheartedly believe they will never. The add old a new map's map just going to become a new map. That's what they, I. Think. They just, they mm-hmm. just did a change where they just revamped like four or five, like huh. fully revamped well, four or five areas of the game. I think that if they added a new map, it could be, it would be one of the dumbest things they could possibly do for that. Wow, game. earmark that. F- yeah, at least well, like okay, that I'll, I'll, I'll isolate <laughs> that with clip. The, earmark, then I'll at least caveat <laughs> at the current moment in this yeah. game. <laughs> if it may be down the line, there will be a point where it will make more sense, but I. I fully believe they'll never add a new map, and I think it would be a bad idea for them to do so. On a related note, I saw a story, I believe, on IGN today that uh, that some somebody estimated, some analyst or somebody estimated that Epic's now worth between like five and eight billion dollars yep, because yeah. of Fortnite. If I am Mark Rain and Tim Sweeney and the the founders <laughs> of Epic, I'm cashing out. I'm selling high. But they already, like like Tencent already owns Epic, <laughs> but not but not all of it, <laughs> right? I think it's it's some maybe percentage. a majority. It's stake some of it. It's a majority yeah. stake. Yeah. But yeah, boy, what I I would yeah. walk away right now. I'd be like, <laughs> bye. And I would it. I would guess <laughs> Cliff Blazinski still has stake in Epic. I don't I know. I mean, so. fa- Cliff say. he did uh, my IGN unfiltered show, yeah, and he Donald has. Uh, and I and I say but he this, worked on Fortnite, so I say this respectfully. Cliff has uh, fu money from Facebook. Mm. From Oculus. I didn't know. Oh, from, from Oculus. Yeah, okay. Ocu- from va- Facebook buying Oculus. Right. Interesting. In addition to his whatever uh, yeah. I- I- equities he has in Epic and, and Unreal and the Unreal Engine. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, Cliff's doing just fine. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, in all my years covering video games, I don't know that I've ever seen a phenomenon quite like Fortnite. You should get it on the Switch. Give uh, it a try. I, I, uh, it is free. I have thought about giving it a try. But there's so much to play. There's too much to play. Yeah. <laughs> and it seems like quite a big investment. Anyway. I didn't care for it, but I'm glad that I tried it. Yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, this week, uh, Ryan, I'm very curious to hear your mm. thoughts on this. There are some uh, new rumors about the next Xbox. This is uh, Scarlet. Yeah, Project Scarlet. I think we first heard about that around E3. Yeah. Uh, they, you know, uh, Phil said straight up during their E3 press conference that they're yeah. already working on the next Xbox. But these new rumors uh, report that. Uh, if, if these are true, there's going to be two models of the next Xbox. One will be a more traditional console that we're used to, and one that is a streaming-only box. Yeah, Scarlet Cloud yeah, is exactly. what you're referring to, is what uh, the Therat report yeah. said. And yeah, I mean, this is a rumor that's actually, <laughs> it's been kicking around for a while. And I say that not to spit in the face of the validity of, of the rumor reporting, mm. 
But I feel like this is this is clearly a thing that Microsoft's been thinking about for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we heard this like we heard this almost exact thing years ago for the Xbox One, and it never obviously never has yet to come to pass where it's just a a streaming box. But we're getting there, right? I mean, this is sort of this is sort of the uh, evolution of of what the original thesis of the Xbox One was that <laughs> was summarily rejected <laughs> by by the world at large at the time, and justifiably so. It was you know their implementation wasn't ideal. They yeah. did they obviously the messaging is and the, how poor that was has been gone over time and again. But but yeah, like everything they're doing now is building towards this as as a viable option. The uh, you know the everything Xbox Live is cloud based. You can you know, most everybody has just one Xbox, but here where we work with, we have a ton of Xboxes around. What I love about the Xbox is you can sign into any Xbox in this office with your profile and then just all your stuff's just there. They're all just dumb terminals. There's nothing's just locked. It's not like a switch mm -hmm. where it's just your profile's locked to that machine and if that machine breaks, you're totally SOL. And the, the thing they announced in the middle of the press conference, the fast start, where it's right. like, all right, games are going to just, if you're going to stream a game, download it, it's going to get started quicker now. Like, that's a building block mm -hmm. towards this. And, and Xbox Game Pass, which has continued to exactly. grow. Microsoft just had a $10 billion uh, revenue year for the gaming side of the business mm -hmm. and for the fiscal year that ended June 30th. And, they, and Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft, specifically called out uh, Mixer, and Xbox Live and Game Pass as primary drivers of that. So between you look at Game Pass and what they're pushing there, every first party game day one on Game Pass, yeah. and this fast start thing, and you know the continuance, the Azure Cloud stuff they've been building for years, it th this is going to happen eventually. Uh, it's inevitable. So what what is a streaming box? mean to you no no physical media right and ostensibly also you won't be downloading the games so there's right. no like big yeah. hard drive that's I, just, my suspicion is you won't own anything it'll literally be like netflix where if you want to own your games and you know and just have them what be it physical or digital uh that's when you buy the regular scarlet the yeah. set top box that we all know and have now yeah but yeah if you if you as they continue to push game pass and push uh, that as a service and gaming as a service in, uh, on both a micro and macro level, I think, yeah, you could just buy the cheaper streaming Scarlet Cloud box well, and I not think, own anything. According to the report, the box itself is more expensive, but will end up being cheaper in the long run well, because you're right. not buying games. Not more expensive than the Xbox, just more expensive than, than just being than, a dumb terminal. Right, than a Roku. Stream. Gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Yeah, so to, to be clear, the rumor is that they finally, and this is all rumor, right, but right. but the rumor is that they cracked the code and figured out how, like this is on live, right? Like this technology that ended up being, you know, a decade or more ahead of its time, it yeah. turns out, where the game is running somewhere else, not mm -hmm. in your living room, on some high-end supercomputer, you know, badass machine. Um, and then that's being streamed to you and then your inputs are being sent back to the server and the problem was you know input lag they mm. couldn't quite it just you know they couldn't quite get over the hump like the technology wasn't quite there and now the rumor is that they've cracked it by doing a little bit of the calculations in that cheap box that's in your living room some of the hit detection mm. and some of the other stuff is being done by that machine in your living room even though the rest of the game is you know off running in the cloud on some supercomputer somewhere and that's what makes the games feel good and responsive and fast and um that passes like what do i know i'm non-technical but that passes the smell test of like yeah this is like you know some r d group that's been thinking about this yeah, a long time even, even crackdown three don't laugh like that that could they might be using that multiplayer as sort of a a little bit of a test bed for this mm -hmm. like because that's the remember the idea for that is that the, the super destruction the yeah is is amplified the processing power is amplified by uh, servers in the cloud to, yeah. to make the city. You don't laugh at me, laugh at Microsoft, Tom. You <laughs> I, don't believe it's ever going to happen. You don't. So what was that? What was that other game that was talking about how there were like server side calculations? Oh, it was Sim City. You guys remember that? There I were. Don't I don't remember that about Sim City. The newest so, Sim City had all this jargon. A bunch of hokum. About, oh, yeah, about this like total BS. It where couldn't they were run like, on your machine because yeah, sending the calculations. we can't we can't put an offline mode in the new Sim City because oh, right, there are yeah. server side. 
calculations for the number of ci- like civilians that are walking around. And then they, someone like the first week was like cracked it so that they could just run it and yeah. no, there was no gameplay difference. Mm-hmm. So when you say stuff like that, it just, it makes me laugh because it's like, we've heard that before. Right. But, yeah. But well, we've heard a lot of this before. Yeah. I mean, we'll, we'll see. I mean, I don't, I don't know. We, we actually don't know. Sorry to get off on the tangent with Crackdown. We don't know what what Crackdown's multiplayer will ultimately be right. because that game's been through a lot and mm-hmm. no one's seen the multiplayer in like three or four years. But just as a, it's, it, it could end up being a a little a little test case that we might look back on and go, oh yeah, look, they were kind of testing that with this. Mm-hmm. I think this tech is fascinating. Uh, but my question to you, you three is: Do you like the idea of a streaming box? No, I mean. No, like what's gut? My gut says no, but there are reasons it's really good. I mean, so, I don't, like my, my internet went out last night. Yeah, yeah. What, I mean, like, there's that. So that <laughs> that's the biggest data thing. caps. Bandwidth yeah. data caps it, even more so because I uh, these guys from a group called Shadow came into our office just a couple weeks ago, right before Comic Con, uh, and showed me their streaming service called Shadow, which is basically this. It's like you pay $35 a month, you basically rent a $2,000 computer, and you just stream that to your devices. And to their credit, when it was working, it worked perfectly. Like, when it was actually, when the internet was solid, it I could not tell I was streaming a game. So you could but, say that the shadow knows? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Definitely but, say that. <laughs> but as soon as there was, like, a slight dip, you could tell that the resolution was like variably scaling and like that's not their fault that's just like that's just what happens right they started shadow ser- this shadow service in france and in france everyone has great internet and so it like wasn't a problem yeah. and the, the like the guy who created shadow came over and he told me he was like we came to america and we were shocked about like how inconsistent how many data caps right. how expensive it is all of this stuff and i think that no matter how good you get the tech of a streaming box mm-hmm. The United States infrastructure is not strong enough to support something like this consistently. Literally, I ran an article about how this this trend scares me recently, and we posted it. Uh, IGN Australia posted it to their Facebook page, and the IGN Australia pitch for it was like, "Yeah, but will it work in Australia?" Because like Australia's internet's even worse than ours. I don't disagree with anything you just said, Tom, but I would just point out that Microsoft was summarily laughed at slash doubted 15 plus years ago when they decided to ship their brand new console <laughs> with an ethernet port and said, we're going to have a broadband only yeah. online gaming service. And everybody was like, that's ridiculous. We're all on dial up. This is, there's no infrastructure for this. It's stupid. This uh-huh. is going to work. So you're not wrong in anything yeah. you just said. I don't agree. I don't disagree with any of it, but you know, the, I, I wouldn't, be surprised if Microsoft does find a way to pull this off in the it, next three to five this, years. This it could be where the infrastructure is going. The, yeah. the infrastructure will never catch up unless there's services and people sort of demand the need for it. Like you have to prove the business case and prove the need for it. Uh-huh. And then, you know, everything kind of comes in lockstep together. Like even mobile bandwidth, like more and more of our life happens on our mobile phones and we use more and more mobile data. And as a result, you know, people get access to more and more and faster mobile data. Like, yeah. I I think there's also another aspect of this that I love, which is it does bring high higher end gaming to people who are not financially able to do so usually, right? You, you, like the the streaming service that I was talking about earlier, you know, not everyone can afford a twenty or two thousand dollar PC, and this allows people to do that in a in a different way. It's still very expensive with a monthly fee, but it allows people to do that. Not everyone can afford whatever Xbox Scarlet is going to cost, so this n- streaming box would probably cost significantly less than that. I like that side of it because I always like the idea of making gaming more accessible to more people. The thing I'm more most worried about through all of this is if it is a you don't buy any of the games, Mm -hmm. what happens in 20 years when Microsoft announces they're no longer supporting the cloud service of Xbox Scarlet, whatever, and then, like, is your game library just gone? I mean, that's a legitimate concern, and that's something that that, uh, preservationists, the the community has brought up. I mean, that that is a very valid concern. Why yeah, do you that, think I mean, that's, that's, no one ever brings that up with Netflix? Like, why people yeah. are mm. totally unconcerned with owning movies anymore, yeah. but they are that's, very concerned with owning games. I spent a long time, you know, uh, I collected every single Marvel movie on Blu ray, like just in time for like Blu ray to not really be the format anymore. <laughs> and now it's like, well, shit, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do with, you know, Iron Man 2 on Blu ray? Like, yeah. 
And so now I stopped. Now I'm buying movies digitally. And I've picked, I, you know, I'm like, oh, should I be buying them on iTunes? Should I be buying them on Amazon? And I picked Amazon. That's it. That's where I'm <laughs> going to buy my digital movies. And like, mm-hmm. obviously, Amazon is, you know, going to be the first trillion dollar company, one of the biggest companies on earth. But I still don't have a guarantee that they're going to be around forever. Yeah. But is that really better than owning, you know, what's going to be the equivalent of a pile of VHS tapes in a decade? Like, those are all th- also worthless to me. Like, I, w- mm. I will say, Damon, one of the most popular articles on IGN on a consistent monthly basis is what's leaving Netflix. It's true. This yeah. month. So there is there is oh, a lot is of true. You're right about that. interest in that. There's that kind of no winning. At least like you know, I own an NES and I own a bunch of NES carts, and I guess I could get the cabling and the adapters. Took that up to my TV. Like Ugh. that's an option that I have available to me. That that's superior to you know an eShop that can literally just go offline and then mm-hmm. it's all gone. You know, from a consumer standpoint, but. They're functionally the same. Like the older I get and the more I see technology evolve, you kind of just give up. And it's like, well, I don't ever trust that if I spend money on Apollo 13 or whatever, like I'm going to have access to that forever. Like it's sort of just something for right now in the mm-hmm. moment. I, I think you're, that's a fair point, though, especially because one of the problems or one of the differences might also just be a historical perception, which is that buying movies has always been cheaper than buying games. Buying a game is well, not when VHS first sort of like you know true. VHS tapes used to cost like eighty bucks right. in like the mid eighties. Yeah, like, did not. That's a little different. See, I wasn't Just alive saying. during the mid eighties, so. <laughs> but I mean, I remember, you, you yeah. can even like even on a platform like Steam, like there's not a requirement that those games keep being supported through new Windows updates. Like I think it's yeah. it's either Fallout Three or New Vegas. Just doesn't work anymore. Because yeah, it used fall, games for it's Fallout Three. Game used we games were, for Windows Live. It works if you buy it through GOG. Exactly. Dan yeah. Stapleton and I were just talking about this. Uh, somehow we were talking about the first Prey, mm-hmm. the mm. one from like 2006 or so. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and apparently, it's you can't you can't buy it, on, or maybe it's just not on Steam on PC, but it's only on GOG. Right. But it's like I was like, oh well, I have the 360 disc at home. There, I guess Pre- uh, Bethesda so we, has like retconned backward, it. It's, it's not backwards compatible. Like and I'm not sure about that, but I, we were talking specifically about the PC version. Silver's yeah. Silver's Transformer game, the licensing went up, and it's you gone. can't buy that anymore. Yeah. The I mean, Scott Pilgrim game on PS4 or PS3, you yeah. can't buy anywhere anymore. You could probably like Damon. I share your concern. Like you don't actually own these games, and you're just renting them. But my feelings on this have evolved even since I've worked at IGN. I'm sure you could chart back to old like tech fetishes <laughs> and and <laughs> game scoops. Whereas like it used to really bother. me. Like I have a thousand games on Steam that I don't own. I'm just paying for the right to play them, and I, right. you know, I can't pass them on to my kids and all that stuff. But um, the more times that that's passed, and as Netflix, as you said, has become more and more popular, I just don't. I, I'm over it. Like I've given up. I've given up on like I'm ever going to have a library of stuff that's mine to keep for my yeah. life. Yeah, I just think it's interesting. People people are fine with not owning movies, fine with not owning music, but yeah. gamers still want to own their games. I just think it's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Uh, all right, it'll be interesting to follow uh, exactly what the next generation of consoles brings and what Sony will be offering uh, to sort of match up to Microsoft. Well, they did PS Now, so in some yeah. ways there's this tug and push and pull on like who's yeah. who's really leading the game there. There's That's a rum- rumor Google's gotten into that game too with a streaming box of their own. Yeah, I don't know. Next gener- <laughs> the next generation will be very interesting. Let's check in with the listeners. Hey, listeners. Listeners, remember you can always reach us at the email address gamescoop at IGN.com, just like Tommy the Cat did. Whoa, is that a real cat? I don't know. Maybe he's a, <laughs> maybe he's a Primus fan. Tommy the Cat says, has the AAA third-party back catalog porting hype train to Switchville Whoa. stopped already? Wait, what? A lot of he's, hyphens in there. Yeah. I think he, along with some other people, were uh, expecting a lot more uh, current generation AAA ports to come to gotcha. Switch. But it's sort of, like, if you look at the Switch release calendar... Bethesda or Bust. I was going to say, Bethesda, what, I don't Nintendo, think it was... Well, right? Bethesda's already It there. was never a train. It was like a, <laughs> it was it was like some, it was a sedan well, like where, Bethesda. like, Wolfenstein came out of the front seat, and then that was it. <laughs> There's Wolfenstein 2, Doom is on there, Skyrim's on there. Yeah, Skyrim's uh, not current gen. No, six well, years okay. old. Yeah, but still, it Seven. is at least Skyrim's a AAA. Skyrim's always current gen. Yeah. Forever, so, forever. That's true. <laughs> uh, Dark Souls Remastered is supposed to come this summer, but, like, and then Ubisoft brought South Park. Dark Souls is also last gen. Uh, is that true? Yeah. Dark Souls Remastered? I don't know. It's hard to keep track. The original. Anyway, that's it. There's like no other, when you look at the release calendar, it's yeah. just Nintendo first party stuff and then smaller games, you know. Uh, does that surprise you guys? Uh, it surprises me that more people maybe haven't jumped on board, but uh, I was never expecting it to be like an enormous flood right out the gate. Maybe not an enormous flood, but 
any any uh, big triple bigger triple A game that comes to Switch has the added benefit of being uh, portable. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, so, like the Switch is. I love my Switch, but come on, like the thing's less powerful than an iPad. <laughs> well, what? So what it but says it can to run me, Wolfenstein Two. Yeah. And pardon me, I'm going to, uh, if we get our, get out our office space, jump to conclusions, Matt. I'm going <laughs> to use that right now. But I would think that, that's, that this, this is an indication that the Dooms, the Wolfensteins, even the Skyrims maybe haven't sold super great. Hmm. Because I would think that other publishers, other publishers have that sales data. They know. Hmm. Everybody, know all the, everybody in the industry knows what these things are selling because they're all making market decisions based off of what the other guy's doing. So I, it would it would say to me, I would suspect that, uh, you know, everybody's saying, all right, should we bring our, should we port our, our AAA game over to Switch? Hmm. Bethesda didn't have a lot of luck with their stuff. Let's mm. let's not bother. Yeah. I don't know. I could be completely could be. wrong. Bethesda again. did do it three times, though, to be fair. They did, but, you know. So there, it's hard to say. Be, it's hard, it is hard to like, say. I, and I don't know if this story is apocryphal, but there was a rumor for many years that Blizzard was one of the first companies to support Mac games natively, like World of Warcraft and StarCraft came out of the Mac, and they didn't tell anyone that those Mac versions were actually super popular because, like, they're in business for themselves, right? Like right. they'll let other companies figure out that there's actually millions of gamers there. But you're right; you'd think we would have seen more people toe dip in there if it were working. I mean, Side we, note, saw, we saw Diablo three on Switch. What? Let's go! Yeah, please. That would rock. See, Hello? I think that's a perfect that's, example. Yeah, we would. 2012 game, yeah. folks. Let's we go. We did just see Fortnite though, and Paladins just entered free to play this week too. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are those aren't exactly AAA behemoths or anything. They, I mean, well, Fortnite well, is, but Fortnite, Paladins yeah. but isn't. But it's free to play. I mean, they count. Yeah. Yeah, I think they count as well. I think it's just, I think part of it also might be that Bethesda, Bethesda has done the most of any AAA developer, but Bethesda also uh, got on the got on that hype train yeah. very early. And it's not like you can just flip a switch and have a port of a game that was made for PS4 to come out onto Switch, right? You, like it probably takes a little while to yep. to turn that around. Mm. Warframe is coming to Switch, but again, that's not coming for a while probably. That's true. The console is, I mean, only 2 years old. Like it's been out quite a while, but it, you know, this stuff takes time and from the moment, you know, some executive is like, "Yep, let's go." Like you have to contract the porting house and figure out how to downres everything like, you know, I, maybe we will see more of that like next year. If, I think if, when the Switch came out also like people weren't mm-hmm. sure it was going to be successful. Well, that's that's yeah. exactly what I was going to say is if this were pretty much any other uh, of the last several Nintendos, we right. we'd all be sitting here going, "No, of course we're not surprised that <laughs> but the Switch being as successful as it is, it's like, yeah, well, yeah actually yeah. it is a surprise that more stuff hasn't come over." Yeah, and that we're just seeing a, we're just seeing a big gold rush with indie games yeah. to the Switch yes. uh, being ported over from uh, Steam and PC and even mobile. So I, I don't know. I guess I'm a little bit surprised. Firewatch that, like, on Switch, Inside on Switch. Well, yeah, you can that right. on there. Uh, like the maybe not like Tomb Raider. You know, maybe not Rise, but I think the uh, Tomb Raider reboot could certainly right. run on Switch. And like things like the two Deus Ex games uh, that we good. got. Like, you get Final good. Fantasy 15 Pocket Edition on there. <laughs> I mean, sure, yeah, why not? <laughs> um, all right, moving on. This is Joseph Marcus. Sounds like Marcus. I had the distinct pleasure of attending a panel. Hosted by Damon at San Diego Comic Con this oh, past weekend that's about you. notable indus- that's me notable industry writers and the keys to great storytelling. Yeah, we had uh, uh, Tip Price, Scott Snyder, and Jordan Vote Roberts all on a panel to talk about uh, the challenges of creating new IP in an industry that's all too happy to just churn out sequels. He says I thoroughly enjoyed the panel. Even said so right to Damon's face. <laughs> <laughs> is, he, is that true? Did he do that? Yeah, he told me. Excellent. Uh, he says, I asked a question at the panel about determining reasons as to why people consume previously existing IP more so than trying something new. I wanted to get your perspective on this as it relates to video games and its mm. fandom. I have a theory where I think that wanting to be considered true fans of a franchise and getting past certain fandom gates is really important to players. So much so that they'd rather play 10 games in one franchise rather than try 10 games that are each based on new IP. Do you guys agree with that? Is it really about fandom or is there something more subconscious at play here with humans not wanting to try new things? I would love to hear your thoughts. I think it's cash, man. That's my theory. Whoa, is that how so? Is that money, games are, again, games are expensive and yeah. you want to be investing in something that has a little bit of a track record that mm. you kind of know what you're going to get more. It's a safer purchase. Exactly. Because it's, it's a known quantity. Yeah, yeah, Maybe yeah. Maybe it's something that you've even enjoyed in the past so it would make sense that you would enjoy the next. I think I think there's also a psychological element where it's just people tend to gravitate towards things they recognize. Yeah. Well, mm. Cash and time. Yeah. No, I, I think that's my my main 
thought yeah, about that. Yeah, I absolutely that. think it's just human. It's just human nature. Familiar is comfortable. Yeah, it, you know, it, you're less like people don't. I, you know, I don't like. I don't want to try new foods. I want to just go get. I'm going to get the same thing off the menu that I know I, I love. Why should I? Why should I risk having mm-hmm. a meal that I don't enjoy when I know there's an enjoyable thing right there that I can order? Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure there's all sorts of factors. Nostalgia is another big factor as you grow up and get older. Uh, if there's a story component, you know, to this series, obviously you're more likely to want to continue following the story along. Yeah, I mean, I was playing through Final Fantasy 15, and like part of what I enjoyed about that game was some of the music callbacks, right? Like it brought back classic Final mm-hmm. Fantasy themes in ways that, uh, like that music's not objectively better than the music in a game like Octopath, but because it means something to me from when I was 12 that increases my enjoyment of that game. And that's just like an incumbent advantage that like long running franchises have. Same with Zelda. Like you mm. get the Zelda theme at like really key moments in Breath of the Wild. Um, yeah, for sure. Well, Octop- Octopath Zelda has really good music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just, that, that's <coughs> what I mean though. Like if you were to say someone that had no experience with either of those games and put those themes side by side, one's not better than the other, but, um, but one has a history to it. Right. True. Yeah. Worth pointing out though that this is actually kind of a little bit, and this isn't a hard rule, but a little bit of the opposite effect for indie games. Indie games actually have a lot more trouble with anything with a two in it. Uh, sequels mm-hmm. to very, very popular indie games will often, if they're called just like such and such two, will often do much, much worse. And it's the reason you see a lot of <laughs> indie games not call them se- their sequels two. Like a like a Super Meat Boy, Super Meat Boy Forever is a direct sequel to Super Meat Boy, and it's Ooh, not being called Super Meat Boy. I don't Boy think too. it is. It it's is more of an endless runner. No, I've talked about this with the developers. <laughs> They're very clear that this is a direct sequel to Super Meat Boy, and they just didn't want to call it fight, that. Fight, fight, well, fight. Well, it's just different gameplay too. It's yeah. it's it's very it's much more similar than you'd think, but they they're trying to At the levels procedurally generated. <laughs> They're handcrafted and then procedurally put together. So mm. trust me, they, this is not my words. They are calling <laughs> okay. it a sequel. Okay. But yeah, it's that's just. I'm a trying thing to think of games. examples where they did use two, like the Culling Two. Is that an example? Uh, well, Banner Saga. <laughs> Banner Saga. They just put out three, though. Yeah, they did. <laughs> but but two did worse than one. Yeah, they they've sort of struggled to save one along. Yeah, it can well, be hard to recapture the magic and attention from. Uh, Again, hmm. not not a hard rule, but sure. it, it is it is a little bit different with things that are not huge recognizable. I mean, names. it's a little like one of the side effects of just the modern age is that if something's successful, it will continue on into perpetuity in one form or another. It will get spin-off comic books, and you know everything gets an action figure now, even weird, esoteric. You know, there's mm-hmm. you know Twin Peaks merch, like you know nothing. I've said it before on Scoop many times that like nothing goes away. Nothing goes away like, forever anymore, and stuff used to go away forever. Like they made a Ghostbusters one and two, and then that was it. And yeah. then, you know, Long later time. they're like, okay, cartoons, comic books, and all that stuff. Big ups to uh, Robert Zemeckis and Bob Gale, who have steadfastly said there will never be a Back to the Future four yeah. while we're alive. <laughs> so, what about a reboot? Take though? That. The, clock, the clock is ticking. They, they control yeah. everything. Yeah. That. It didn't always used to be that way, though. Like, not everything got secret. Razor Crane yeah. coming back. That's true. Yeah, Frazier's according, coming to, back? according to the yeah. report today, I, just, I read a discussion. story that <laughs> Frazier's coming back. Didn't or, Mad About You come back or something like that? One, uh, Will and Grace came back. Will and Grace, mm. came back. yeah, 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 that's true. I don't know. As for wanting to be accepted by a game's fandom, I don't know. That's not. A, that's I mean, it's not important to me. Maybe it's important to some. The gatekeeping aspect of it, like you're not a true fan unless it's like get out of here with that baloney. But um, <laughs> but I don't I don't know if that's actually informing people's purchase intent too much. Yeah. Uh, all right, this is Doctor B. Ooh. A real doctor says, thank you for doing what you do. I'm a longtime listener. I just finished seven years of surgical training where I struggled to find the time to change my socks and making time to play video games was out of the question. IGN podcast became a way for me to bide my time and get a small dose of gamer culture. Why didn't you play games instead of listening to the podcast? <laughs> Maybe he was in the podcast. He can listen to the podcast while he's doing games. surgery. Oh, yeah. boy. <laughs> and it's, it's actual surgeon simulator. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> We'll get to that. He says, I'm writing to let you guys know about the connection between gaming and surgical training. Over the past few decades, technology has allowed surgeons to access patients' insides with very small or even no incisions. These days, small cameras are placed through small ports or natural orifices, and surgeons look at screens to perform their procedures. Neat. Justin, what's a natural orifice? Uh, like a butthole. Okay. I remove kidney stones with tiny scopes equipped with lasers to blast rocks without having to make a single cut. Asteroids. Yeah. The overlap with gaming skills seems obvious to me. We navigate a 3D space via a 2D view on a screen to perform a task. 
Starting in the 1990s, studies were done that showed gaming increased the rate of minimally invasive skill acquisition. My favorite study showed that three hours of gaming a week made a huge difference in training performance. They used Super Monkey Ball, mm-hmm. Silent Scope, and Star Wars Pod Racer on the GameCube <laughs> awesome. as their games. Weird. The lead surgeon on the study was known to warm up on a gaming tower before entering the operating room. That's really cool. That's N- great. Now there are surgery sims where trainees hone their skills on what are essentially surgery video games. Unfortunately, the production quality of these sims falls far short of what a commercial gamer would expect these days. On the flip side, commercial surgery games prioritize fun and even wackiness like Surgeon Simulator or Trauma Center. and They don't try to be realistic surgical simulations. My question is is do you think there would be an appetite among non-medical Raising. gamers <laughs> for a high-quality but true-to-life surgical simulator for the general market? Would you guys play that game, or would this have the same appeal as a flight simulator to people without interest in aviation? It's really cool. Like I'm you know, glad that that exists, and I'd yeah. like to see you know, more realistic, hardcore surgeon simulators exist for surgeons. But um, just like you said, that doesn't make it fun yeah the more realistic something is like there's sort of an inverse relationship between how fun it is yeah there are a lot of like realistic games out there like farming simulator that i think yeah try to they all have a level of abstraction to a certain extent to like to to up the fun factor i don't want to go looking for polyps up somebody's (laughs) colon in a video game yeah maybe not me also there's like you know i i I use video games as an escape from real life (laughs) and like maybe like being a surgeon, performing surgery, having someone's life in your hands is maybe a little too close to the the uh, yeah. unpleasant realities. I think of, of one life of my anyway. favorite let's plays I've ever done in my life was Anthony Gallegos and I doing Surgeon Simulator. Like that, yeah, like the wackiness of that game is the, pretty good. There is a game called PC Building Simulator where yeah. you just build a PC, and I feel like <laughs> the House if, Flipper. Yeah, House Flipper, where you you clean and then touch up and make a house nice and then sell it for more money than there's you bought. There's a lot of realistic for. games like that. Uh, I, I think there's probably a market. I'm sure there's people out there because I don't like Euro Truck Simulator, but I know people who only play Euro <laughs> Truck Simulator. So. You actually know people that oh, only yeah, play that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Uh, Crazy man, and popular in do you remember? I barely remember Trauma Center. Didn't it get yeah, really? Weren't, didn't was you bomb. end up like drawing like pentagrams and didn't it get all weird? Like, didn't well, it I know it's weird. weird. I don't know about it. I don't know if it got like I think satanic. It, it I think it did. Like it alien ended up being stuff, like, right? yeah, it was like aliens and magic spells and stuff. I'm I pretty sure. magic spells, but. I maybe am making that up. <laughs> I, I remember it going way off the rails. It, do, it definitely gets crazy. I liked the Trauma Center games. I'm sure yeah. that there's a mar- there, there are people out there. I don't know how big that audience is. I'm on the Switch. Yeah. Well, uh, <laughs> speaking of, they, I think we did, they just announced today, Surgeon Simulator is coming to Switch. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah. Put, that, put that on the pile. Uh, I, I think that if my Super Monkey Ball skills are any indication, I should not be a surgeon, Probably is, not. is what I learned from this conversation. Great, yeah. Yeah. Monkey Ball is a great one. Yeah, it is. I don't really see how that relates. Well, it's, it's like you gotta really, be really fine motor. Yeah, like, yeah. And okay. it's only the joystick. It's not like twitchy. Yeah. Yeah. It's actually, I, I see how that trains. Plus the collecting bananas, like, you know. There's that too, that's, yeah. That's surgery. Lots to collect in the human body. Mm-hmm. All sorts of collectibles. In there. I've played Operation. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's share what we've been playing. Justin, I know you've been enamored with Final Fantasy 15. Yeah. You beat it. We did Scoop two weeks ago, and I was yeah. asking for I need a big AAA game to get through when my family's out of town, and I did pick Final Fantasy 15, and I'm very, very glad I did. Uh, man, I really, really love it. Um, I love it sort of warts and all, like that yeah, game, and I would tweet it out, like how confused game. it made me feel. Like, I've never played a worse amazing game <laughs> Or a more amazing bad game. Like, I don't know which way to put it. Like, <laughs> it falls down in so many, like, fundamental ways and just fails at well, telling so a coherent story. What are some examples of its failings? <sighs> like, I, 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 it's unfathomable, like, how bad that game is at telling a story. Like, I didn't understand, you know, where I was or what I was doing or why I was doing it for, like, so many large portions of the game. But... The characterization of the characters is so yeah, good. Yeah, they're really likable. They're really likable, and the acting's really good, and you care about them, and you care about the relationship between the the uh, the love interest in the game, even though she has, like, no screen time. So in some ways, it's, like, such an amazing, incredible achievement that, like, w- like this is getting me so emotionally invested in it, uh, but in some ways it does feel like a missed opportunity. Like, if that game actually fired on all cylinders, it would be one of the greatest games of all time, I think. Um but it doesn't, and I'll have to settle for it just being, you know, um, something that I feel like spoke to me. Uh, 
but man, I, I, uh, I love it. And, um, my family's back in town, so I'm not going to get as much time with it anymore, but I do. You beat it though, right? Uh, the credits rolled on it, but that game more so than most has, it's like such a cliche Uh, thing to say, but the game kind of starts when the credits roll. (laughs) Like there's way, way more post game stuff than there there really has any right to be. Like it just keeps going and going and going. So I hope to work my way through some of that. Um, I've been playing a lot of another JRPG, Octopath Traveler. Yeah. Which is really, really good. I'm, I'm sure that's not news to anyone. But. Yeah, yeah I've I'm, been in the, that too. I'm in the same boat. Yeah. Uh, I just chip away a little bit, like kind of what ends up being 20 to 30 minutes right before bed. Yeah. I just play, <laughs> I've been playing in handheld mode. For some reason, I just like, I want to play that game in handheld mode mm-hmm. as opposed to putting it up on the TV. I don't know why. But um, it's, well, yeah, the, the music's so serene. Music is great. Every new area, I'm, I like stop. It's the, the, the visuals mm-hmm. are. I can't crow on about the art style yeah. enough. Every new area is beautiful in its own way, and I'm uh, really loving a lot of the... I'm, I think I'm, I've still only met like four of the characters. Mm-hmm. I'm just going around, sort of doing my first lap of the world, yeah. meeting everybody and doing their uh, their sort of prologue bit. Uh, but man, it's good. It is so Same. good. The, I love the combat. I love everything about that video game and i love it's like i look forward to it at the end of my night yeah for and sure. i've got a nice long flight to the to the midwest coming up go. where i'm like <laughs> oh yeah here we go this is gonna be like five hours of this i can finally binge it yeah no i love the conceit of the eight different characters each has their own story each has their own abilities but you can only have four of them in your party so you get to customize it that way and then each one has between their special abilities and and being able to like summon npcs to fight in battle right. there's like all these different options for how you approach combat of the the sort of puzzle mystery of figuring out the vulnerabilities of the enemies, man, there's a lot going Gotta on. Got bring Cyrus along, do that, analyze. Yeah, exactly. I mean, did you know by the way that the Final Fantasy 15? I'm going back to it. The, <laughs> okay. the, you just reminded me the multiplayer. So it came out with the multiplayer expansion. The game came out and like a year later, Final yeah. Fantasy 15 multiplayer comrades, and everyone's like, no one gave a shit. Like no one played it. Nobody cared. That's like a game inside the game. It's like Monster Hunter. Like it's so much more elaborate than I expected. It's got new characters and new story and it's set in sort of a gap in the single player story. So it's filling in story gaps on what characters are doing and where they are. And you um, you basically the whole world's locked for re- a story reason I won't get into and you re-unlock it piece by piece and it's like this is the multiplayer yeah like, well, what is what is the gameplay though it's uh it's like Final Fantasy 15 but you go on hunts you basically go out and hunt monsters and then they drop bones and teeth that then you go back to level up your weapons so it's cooperative and, yeah okay and it's like it's way way more like again like it came out and no one cared and I'm like what like you released this for like a year old game and like I don't know like I keep I go through the matchmaking to try to get matched with another person it never finds another human and then I go out with AI and the AI is really good and they're like I'll heal you don't worry and I'm like you're better than a human would be anyway so. <laughs> So anyway, I just want to give a shout out to that for like just again in weird ways that game's oddly deep and polished mm-hmm. that I, I just can't reconcile that with the ways that it doesn't work. And Tom, what you been playing? Uh, well, I was going to touch on Octopath. Um, I've been playing that on my train rides in and out of work, and then also I have two million flights uh, in the next month. So I've got six flights in the next four or five weeks oh, to go man. on, and then I just came back from Comic Con, so I had two yeah. there. And man. Conventions are a hell of a drug, but uh, the yeah, I'm enjoying Octopath a lot, but I'm not not quite as much. I'm as not as overly in love with it as many people I've talked to are. Get out! Um, <laughs> Just, it feels we don't, need, we don't need this negativity. This might feel like a little. <laughs> this might sound a little weird. It's it's weirdly disjointed. It feels very much like a video, like a very transparently a video game to me. Um, and what I mean by that is like. I'm just going through where you are, right? I'm just getting the people right now at the, in the beginning of the game. And Philip tells me it opens up more after that. Um, but right now, it's just a circle path with eight cities. And then you just play, like, the same intro story for every character. And then The you, story's and, not the same, though. Yeah, they're right. Not. But it's the exact same pattern of, like, introduce you to the character, learn what their ability is, right, fight step a boss. outside, yeah. go into a dungeon, fight a boss, and you're done. And, like, it's so transparently that every time. And, like, along the paths, like, there's chests everywhere for you to pick up, but they're all, like, just, like, oh, here's, like, a tiny little path, and then a chest, and then you go back to the main path. And so there's not really much exploration or choice in the paths. You just walk by chests that you pick up. And all of that stuff is not 
bad to me. It's not not fun. It just is so transparently like, this is the video game you're playing. Now this is the secret path with the chest. Here's the boss thing. And it feels very <laughs> unnatural to me in a way that any other JRPG I've played doesn't feel like, especially with how you add people to your party. Because you add people to your party in this game by just meeting them and then they join you and you move on and they have their own story and it has yeah. nothing to do with the other character's story and then you move on with their life. It's my, my party dynamics in JRPGs are my favorite things because some games go to such great lengths to explain yeah, like why, why you're partying together and then some games are just like, look, we know you don't care about this part and you just want to get these people together and right. so they don't bother. It feels like a D&D &D campaign yeah. where you're like, why are we all in this tavern together? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. it doesn't matter, just move on. Yeah. And Exactly. And, and I don't like that as much as other JRPGs where you meet someone and you learn who they are and then what they want. And then, hey, your your desires like are, are in line with each other and you want the same things. And so you pr embark together. Mm -hmm. And again, that stuff is not stopping me from enjoying the game, but it definitely makes it not feel as enthralling as most JRPGs I've played. I can see I can see what you're saying, but I think it's just because of the nature of how they've set this game up with eight different characters, it has. eight different stories. Yeah. And what you just described of what you're doing over and over as you meet, meet the characters, I would just say that's the gameplay loop, right? Which, which I like. This was yeah. the really same developer as Fantasy Life, right? Because that's exactly Is how it that, Fantasy Life. I don't know. Uh, that's how that game set up. That was it's the, uh, bravely uh, default. Bravely, bravely default. Oh, excuse me, yeah, that. yeah, that game, which um, I never played. I'm well, gonna play more of it. I wonder if you'd feel feel differently when because you know you you may be seeing on yours depending on where you are. Like for me. Uh, I think it's like Ulbricht's level two or, or, or chapter two of his story. It's like, well, I mean, we recommend you get to level 27 before right. you do this. So, you know, it's just I feel like it's it's just taking what would be a big, long story and breaking it up into parts that you just do. Well, I'm going to do Cyrus's part now. I'm going to do Ulbricht's part now. I'm going to do Tressa's part now instead of just doing it all right in a one go like you would in a traditional JRPG. Right, and I guess I just don't, I'm just not crazy about that. Like, it's so funny to me that one of the characters embarks, uh, like like Ophelia, who's the cleric, she'll be like, I have to go do this sacred rite yeah. to keep the world to not die from the evil horror that we're protecting with this fire. And then she joins your party and you're like, oh, let's go to the woods now. And like, not go do that thing that she just said yep. she was going to do. But that's just video games. That's but just it's every this video, video game. game. But that's because no. you chose to do it. I went right into the cave. Took on the boss. No, no, no. I'm saying her, after her, her <laughs> chapter two, since it's so far away, you oh, have yeah. to go do other things. So the, the problem with it, I guess I have with it is that it's it's eight JRPGs yes. that you just happen to be playing at the same time. Yes. And yeah. they're all it's good. Awesome. They're all good JRPGs, <laughs> but I dislike that they are so disjointed. Damon That's and all. I aren't seeing the problem here, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Okay. Did, That's a great I, thing about opinions. I downloaded Hollow Knight as well. I'm giving it another yeah. shot. Oh, yes. here now, here we yeah. go. Yes. Yeah. That's the that's one that Tom is on board with. I, it, it, I played, I don't know, I played through like two bosses. Did I dream, by the way, do you fight like a big nest of like bees or something? Not is the that, bees. Is there like an oh. early nest of like big something that you fight, like hornets or something like that? Uh, There's one of those bosses, but that's really late. Oh, I don't know. Well, in any case, I have a vague memory of making it two or three bosses into the game and then kind of falling off it on PC. And so now I'm trying it again on Switch. I will report back next week. Please be excited. Oh, the other thing I real quick wanted to mention that I'm playing. Uh, we just got uh, an early preview build of Monster Hunter World on PC. Oh, yeah. Which I'm crazy excited about. Yeah, we streamed it today. Uh, I was playing it last night. It's the first time I've really played it. I only played about 45 minutes of Monster Hunter World on PS4. And, uh, I thought man, was, I like that game. I thought that was already out because yeah. it's been, like, the top-selling game on Steam for it's been, a long time. So It's been the top-selling game on Steam through pre-orders alone for wow. weeks. And That's it crazy. comes out on August 9th, so it's still a couple weeks away. Okay, well. You know what we need a preview build of, Damon? What's that? My sleeper hit of E3, Tetris Effect. Tetris oh, Effect, oh, there you go. Too, yeah. they, Does that even they, have like a release they, date? They told me at E3 uh, fall, but no date date yet. Hmm. I'm, gonna to I'm, gonna, I'm gonna follow up on that after right, the yeah. show. <laughs> okay, that brings us to Video Game 20 Questions. Our suggestion hey. this week comes from Aaron in St. Augustine, Florida. Let the questioning begin. Okay. Does your character wear a hat? Yes. Oh, oh. boy. David, he did his homework. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, uh, is this game set, or it, was this game released before the year 2000? No. Okay. Um, I like this one. Well, no, that that's a bad question. Never mind. Uh, is this game 
Does this game take place in a first person perspective? Um, uh, only sometimes. Okay. Mm. In okay. A, but that in a, it's an abstraction. So I, I don't want to mislead you. Okay. In a very abstract way, parts of it are in first person. Okay. 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 <laughs> what? Why are you that doing that? That helps <laughs> a lot. Uh, <laughs> I think it'll be made clear. Uh, okay. So 2000 is, um, okay. Did this game come out on like the PS3 and Xbox 360 console generation? Hmm. It's sort of a... It, uh, was it? Uh, I guess would it be better? Can he? Can is he allowed to rephrase that? Sure, sure, sure. sure. As Wait. originally released. Yeah, you want to say it that way? Released. I bet this is probably a PC game, which is why. It, it, okay, is this a PC <laughs> game? No. Damn it! <laughs> 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 Boiled. Uh, uh, okay. Next question, right? So that we didn't. Uh, wait, wait. We we nixed the the PS3. I didn't answer. Well, yeah, you're yeah, welcome okay. to revisit so, that. Okay. Okay. Uh, all right. Was this game originally released on the PlayStation 2 original Xbox GameCube generation? No. Okay. It's five. So that should put What's us that? in the PS3. Or contemporary. You yeah, know, or, or newer, I guess. Not released or, on Or it's PC a handheld. Though. Yeah. Okay. A third-person oh, game with of. some sort of vague first-person, like a cutscene or something. Wait, wait, what generation did you just ask about? PS2 uh, and GameCube. Yeah, PS2, GameCube. Xbox one, original, and Cube. Hmm. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it did not come out on PC. Mm -mm. Could have been an arcade game. We can't rule that out. Let's go, Tom. No, because I'm I'm stuck on something. Because no, 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 no. is this a handheld game? Uh, yes. It got a Elves. handheld release. Gush. Ooh, okay. Oh, so this could be like it, a like it, an Uncharted, uh, Lost Legacy type deal, or or so something like that. Is this a? But he uh, doesn't wear a hat. Is this so. is this an Uncharted Lost Legacy type deal? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? No. Okay. <laughs> what are you doing? It's fine. <laughs> Because um, well, there, there was God of War <laughs> and there was well, but Daxter. The hat thing. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. Maybe one of the other ones wearing a hat. I wasn't asking about that. You understood the question, yeah, right? I understood the question. Thank you. <laughs> I think it's a, prim a franchise that's primarily known for its home console releases. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, go for it. I, I want to know if it's a Nintendo game. Can I, I yeah, ask? What go it, ahead. Is this a yeah. Nintendo game? Yes. Okay, because this is what I was thinking, is if it is that generation, then the abstracted first-person stuff could be, like, point, like, motion control stuff? Yeah, we, we, oh, we could be, oh, this could be, we, well, no, I was going to say it could be a Luigi's Mansion, but we just but ruled we, out That's what GameCube. I was thinking, too. Yeah. The original Luigi's Mansion, but we ruled Mansion. out GameCube. Mm -hmm. uh, what, el what else got, so, okay, hmm. So now I want to know, did this game come to, did this game release on the 3DS? Yes. Okay. Uh, we're, I'm I'm going to be not as helpful here. I yeah. had a 3DS, but yeah. it, it is a bit of a weakness in my expertise. What got ported to the 3DS? And Damon, I want to clarify: when you say this game got a 3DS port, that's like that game got ported to the 3DS. This game came out on the 3DS, as opposed to some version of it. Yeah. Yes, this game, like Mario Party 100 or whatever, is like a new game on the 3DS. But that's not like a port of a game that came out on the 3DS. This game was on 3DS. Got it. But not necessarily originally on 3DS. Okay. okay. Oh, no. okay. That question hasn't yeah. been asked. Okay. So Ocarina of Time. Is there first person stuff on Ocarina of Time? Yeah. You yeah. Shoot bone arrow. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Um. Hmm. Yeah. I, hat wearing character. He hat does. Wearing character. Link does wear a hat. He does. Um. Just to clarify, just remind everybody though, I said this game did not come out before 2000. Yeah, yeah, but the 3DS version did. I don't know. I'm a little lost. <laughs> I'm lost at sea right now. If we no, so if we have to assume that it's. I think we can assume it's something that was on the Wii ported to the 3DS. Or well, more Wii U. Or Wii U. So oh, yeah. So there's like Smash. Mm, but that doesn't have any first person stuff, does it? I mean, it's probably got some weird garbage. I don't, in it. I don't know. So you, 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 it's got a camera mode. <laughs> who's taking those pictures? Um, <laughs> who's taking those pictures? Yeah. Uh, is this a? I'm thinking it, of uh, what? What was the uh, Zombie U? Did that ever come out? <laughs> that didn't come out on 3DS, U, right? Because no. Zombie came out on PC later. Is this game part of a franchise? Yes. That's 10. Okay. 
don't Should know. we just start asking franchises? Mario, Nintendo, or Zelda, any of those? I don't know. For I feel like Mario or Zelda is like a fair bet, isn't it? I One don't know. of those. You got a long road ahead of you. It's too early to give up. Yeah, yeah you're right. He's doing it. Um, uh, is is uh, is the primary character in this game a character that is also featured in Super Smash Brothers? Yes. Okay, so okay. that at we, we're down to a it's, mascot or yeah. I, it's, <laughs> it's none of the weirdo. Wait, 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 wait. Which Super Smash Brothers? <laughs> well, just the fran any of them. Okay, I, I okay. did. It was a franchise okay. question, okay. so I think he gave me that one. Okay. So. Yeah, I think we can. I think it's worth burning two questions on Mario and Zelda. Uh, okay. this could, oh, we could be in a in a Samus such scenario here. A hat <gasps> is a helmet. A hat. <laughs> We've already been down that road. <laughs> so yeah, it could be Samus Mario. Zelda. Is this a Zelda game? No. Is okay. this a Mario game? Yes. Okay. All right. For 3DS, that so was ported. What got ported? Oh, uh, 3DS. Mario. Well, well, not Mario 64. Mar that was the DS. That's the game's also Mario played. Maker, but that does that have any first person any kind of -person weird -ish. things in it? I don't know. <laughs> so and it can't be Mario sixty four also because that was before two thousand, right? Yes. I'm Is it Super Mario Maker? Yep. Woo! <laughs> 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 Nice job. I don't That's know what the first impression. person stuff was in that, but well, what what perspective is it when you're building the level? Because it's just oh, you. Oh, but okay, that's why I was okay. trying to say it's sort of an abstraction. All right. no, like, yeah, that's why I was I'll trying to like it's not you're playing. A, so we went from lost in the woods, dead yeah. in the water, <laughs> to, to victory in what? Twelve? We did it. Fourteen. Fourteen. Okay. your fourteenth. Fourteen's pretty good. Yeah, it is pretty good. It's on the earlier side from <laughs> recently. Put Mario Maker on the Switch. Put Mario Maker <laughs> on the Switch. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think when you're controlling the game, you're Mario, but then when you're actually building the game, it's it's you. You're God, it's you, right? Mm -hmm. you're God. Yeah. yeah, but that's also a point that. of contention. You're Miyamoto. You're Miyamoto. Yeah. No, you're I mean, Miyamoto. I think that by the same count, like Sim City is first person, right? Yeah, or I we the Almighty. See, this has been controversial in the past. Like well, RTS games, are you supposed RT to be like certain RTS like, games have like a conceit of like you're in some mothership looking down at right, the battle, right, right. and some don't even bother. Like. Yeah, yeah. Well, well done, everybody. Um, <laughs> Dude, yeah, Mario Maker. So wait, Switch. so that Too means that means in like Uncharted, are you you're actually controlling the cameraman? <laughs> yeah, yeah that's because then you have control of Nathan Drake. <laughs> yeah, Super no. Mario sixty four, you are controlling the Lakitu, right? Or you're like well, oh, you're only no. the, the camera. camera. That's yeah. just only the camera. Yeah, no, you're still controlling Drake. <laughs> you can just see him. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, I leave you this week uh, with some exclusive world premiere what? music. From Guacamelee 2. Ooh, yeah, we nice. found out this week uh, Guacamelee 2 arrives August 21st on PS4 and Steam, and we have the worldwide debut of some music uh, performed by the performed by the Mariachi Entertainment System. Amazing. Which is a real group. The MES. That does, yeah, the MES that does Mariachi versions of video game tunes. Oh, that's amazing. And they've got some original stuff and some covers in Guacamelee 2. Okay, so. guys, come on out. <laughs> Here they come. <laughs> uh, we have fun. Uh, remember, you can always reach us at the email address, gamescoop at IGN.com. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Ryan. Watch IGN Unfiltered. There you go. Sissy Jones, voice actress from Darksiders 3 and Firewatch. That's uh, one up this week. That's my. Nobody watches it, so I always try to ask people on every show. Some people <laughs> do watch, watch it, it. And the people that do watch it's it, really, really good. they really enjoy it. So check that out. That's live on the site right now? It's up, yeah, okay. on uh, podcast services or YouTube or IGN. All right. My name is Damon. This is IGN Gamescoop. And we're out. Music.